Thank you all. Uh, there was some exaggeration in uh, what Vikram said. I think it's probably four years and not 11 years. But 11 is a number sacred to cricket lovers. Uh, so I'm really happy to be here, and as it happens on the occasion of India's 500 test. I have, uh, I would put it, long, close, but intermit intermittent connections with the city of Hyderabad. I first came here when I was a little boy. Uh, my godfather worked here at the what was then the Regional Research Laboratory. Uh, he's now dead. His name was Katie Achaya. And apart from being a distinguished oil scientist, he was also India's first pioneering food historian and a person of great culture who, among other things, introduced me to classical music. Uh, then there was a long period where I did not come to Hyderabad. But of course, I followed the Hyderabad cricket team from afar, partly with admiration, because who could not admire Pataudi, Jasima, and Abbas Ali Beg, and not least Abid Ali, but also with some uh, ambivalent feelings, because I did not like it when they beat Karnataka. <laughs> uh, then I started coming to Hyderabad a little more regularly. Um, I had close friends here, and indeed the last time I was in this wonderful hall, in this wonderful school, founded by the remarkable Shanta Rameshwar Rao, was to speak in memory of Sujit Mukherjee, the literary historian, publisher, translator, and extraordinary cricket writer. And I remember that occasion well, uh, because in this hall there was a superb speech by Rajan Harshe, and an even better music recital in memory of Sujit Mukherjee by Vidya Rao. And I think I'd much rather hear Vidya Rao again in this hall than actually speak, if I was to be honest. So I, I have a long connection with Hyderabad. But this is the first time I'm speaking in Hyderabad as the capital of Telangana. And I'm not sure it is wise for a speaker to divide, further divide an audience already divided on that subject. Uh, so let me only say that uh, although I know feelings run deep, as a native of Uttarakhand, which broke away from Uttar Pradesh and has never regretted it for a minute. Although we curse the Chief Minister of Uttarakhand day in and day out, but still, I mean, uh, I suppose I have a sneaking sympathy for smaller states. My hope, not yet realized, is that the creation of Telangana would lead to the creation of Gorkha land and Vidarbha and so on and so forth. But that's another matter for another occasion. I'm here today to speak about my new collection of essays Democrats in dissenters. And I'm going to begin with a quotation about India. Uh, it's from Robert Blackwell, who was the <coughs> a former US ambassador to India. And in describing India, he said, India is a pluralist society that creates magic with democracy, rule of law, and individual freedom. It's a society that creates magic with democracy, rule of law, and individual freedom, and of course, cultural diversity. What a place to be an intellectual. I would not mind being born 10 times to discover and rediscover India. Now, this statement is not untrue. But it's meant to flatter his host, we Indians. It's a diplomat statement aimed at flattering his host. Right. But it's not untrue. What I just read out is actually factually correct. But I'm going to juxtapose to what Blackwell said, a statement of my own, which is equally true that I drafted yesterday to share with you. And here is a statement that you will counterpose, should counterpose to Blackwell, also true. And here, here goes. India is a constitutional democracy with a corrupt police force and incompetent judiciary and an increasingly criminalized political class. It is a republic committed to, to equality. It is a republic committed to equality, 
where caste and gender discrimination flourish, where so-called Maharajas who lost their titles decades ago still insist on being addressed as Your Highness. India has a constitution guaranteeing freedom of expression, but where, where the political class encourages the banning of books, works of arts and films. What a place to be an intellectual. I would not be more than 10 times to discover and rediscover India. <laughs> so, I've given you one statement by Blackwell, a, a contrary statement by myself. And finally, I'm going to give you an epigram attributed to Jawaharlal Nehru, whose essence combines Blackwell's remarks about India and my remarks about India. Nehru once said, the Republic of India is home to all that is truly noble as well as truly disgusting in the human experience. <laughs> India is home to all that is truly noble as well as truly disgusting in the human experience. This too makes it a privilege to be an intellectual in India. Since in India, you can study all manifestations of the human experience from the noble to the disgusting and all that lies in between. What makes modern India such a remarkably absorbing place for a scholar to study? And in my view, it's because the Republic of India, the project of creating a united nation out of so many diverse and disparate parts and running it on a democratic template. This is the most reckless political experiment in human history the most recklessly ambitious as well as the most ambitiously reckless political experiment in human history. That's why it's of such interest to scholars who live through it, who live in it and through it to study. I mean, of course, were I not a historian and a sociologist, I'd be better off in Sweden or Canada. You know, also a democratic and free place where you don't have a corrupt political class and a criminalized judiciary and you don't have threats to freedom of expression and so on. But as a, I think all scholars and, and uh, as an editor, Ram Reddy would, I think, endorse this. India is an endlessly fascinating place to write about. The book that, I, uh, that we are discussing today, Democrats and Dissenters, is the fourth in a series of explorations of this reckless democratic experiment. So it's the last, fourth and last in a quartet of books about the reckless political experiment called the Republic of India. The first book in the series, India After Gandhi, was a narrative history that explored the career of Indian democracy in all its nobility and disgustingness from 1947 till today. And I'm now working on a second edition. Uh, since the first edition came out 10 years ago, I want to update it. So that was the first book, a narrative social and political history. The second book in the series, Makers of Modern India, was an edited anthology of the writings of 19 extraordinary thinker activists, uh, starting with Raman, Ram, Mono, uh, uh, Ram Mohan Roy in Bengal in the early 19th century, and ending with an unjustly forgotten Muslim liberal called Hamid Dalwai, who worked in Maharashtra in the 1960s and 70s, with Ambedkar and Phule and Kamla Devi Chattopadhyay and Gandhi and Tagore and Ambedkar and Nehru and several others in between. So it was an anthology of the works of those who argued this republic into existence. The third book, Patriots and Partisans, contains 17 essays on different aspects of politics and society in India. My new book, Democrats and Dissenters, is akin to Patriots and Partisans in that it is also a collection of essays. It's neither a 900-page integrated narrative like India after Gandhi nor is it an anthology of other people's writings and thoughts. It is a collection of essays written by a single hand, namely myself. But it is far more comparative in its orientation than Patriots and Partisans. Patriots and Partisans was resolutely focused on India. It had separate essays on, on the left, on Congress Samchagiri, on Hindutva, and so on. This book, Democrats and Dissenters, is much more comparative in its orientation. Although I call myself a historian, I've actually never studied history formally in my life. Uh, my degrees are in economics and in sociology. Uh, and I'm really a sociologist by training. And as the great Emil Durkheim, who was one of the founders of the discipline of sociology, uh, argued, 
comparative sociology is not a branch of sociology, it is sociology itself. Comparative sociology is not a branch of sociology, it is sociology itself. And that maxim underlies and undergirds this book. Uh, historians stress the specific and the unique and the distinctive. And sociologists don't deny that there are some things, some processes, some debates, some laws, some events, some controversies that are specific to time and place. But sociologists try and look at those them comparatively by comparing and contrasting them with a bit what are broadly similar political and social processes. So this book is explicitly comparative in its orientation. Each essay is either implicitly or explicitly comparative. So the, uh, the book is divided into two parts, eight essays in each part. The first part is called Politics and Society. And it has an essay on China, an essay on Pakistan, and an essay on Sri Lanka, written by an Indian comparing the Indian political experiment with the political experiment of our <coughs> three neighbors, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, and China. So when I, the essay on Pakistan is based on three trips I made to Pakistan, uh, the most recent of which was actually just after 2611, two months after 2611, I went to Pakistan. So that's described in this book, along with my earlier trips. And the focus there is on the conception of Pakistan as a Muslim homeland. And how does the fusion of state and faith, how does the definition of a nation's identity, how, how does defining a nation's identity on a particular religion, in this case Islam, influence its future orientation? And what would have happened, or what might still happen, if India goes the way of Pakistan and bases its identity and its political social practice on a single religion? So, though it's about Pakistan, there's a comparison with India on uh, the crucial issue of should a state base its practice on a single faith. The essay on China uh, is essentially about a visit to China and my interactions with Chinese intellectuals. And it's about the Chinese attitude to linguistic pluralism and ethnic pluralism. And how does that contrast with us? You know, how does the Chinese attitude to the Tibetans and uh, the Uyghurs compare with our treatment of ethnic and linguistic minorities. The essay on Sri Lanka compares their treatment of the Tamils with our treatment of the Kashmiris. I mean, in many ways, this is very clearly comparable. Sri Lanka and India are the only two nations in Asia or Africa with a continuous history of elections and democracy. Going back to the late 40s, I mean, we had the aberration of the emergency. Well, Sri Lanka has had some pretty authoritarian rulers too. But if you look at these two countries, unlike China or Pakistan or Vietnam or Ghana or Nigeria or any number of uh, former colonies in Asia and Africa, which have been very heavily dominated by authoritarian or military regimes, India and Sri Lanka are technically democracies, continuous democracies, but in each case, democracy in most of the nation has uneasily coexisted with suppression or in the Sri Lankan case, civil war in one part of the nation. And I compare our treatment of the Kashmiris, that is the Indian government's treatment of the Kashmiris from 47, with the Sri Lankan government's treatment of the Tamils in the north of the island. And then I go on also to compare the ways in which Kashmiris have resisted discrimination against the Indian state. Tamils have resisted discrimination against the Indian state. And I ask, was it necessary that in Kashmir or in northern Sri Lanka, was it necessary or inevitable that the insurgents, who were very badly treated by their respective governments, but was it necessary or inev inevitable that they take to arms? Or were, were there other ways in which they could have articulated their grievances? So that's, that's also comparative. So there's an essay on China, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka. There are also several essays in part one of the book, which are on specifically Indian developments. But here too, I try and adopt a comparative approach. There's, a, there's an essay on Adivasis uh, and the multiple tragedies they are subjected to, which was first published 
uh, in the e Economic and Political Weekly when Ram Reddy was the editor, and now appears in a substantially revised form. And I try and document the multiple forms of discrimination that the Adivasis in India face, uh, which are social, economic, environmental, legal, political, cultural. And I argue <coughs> that from an economic, political, social point of view, Adivasis are worse off than Dalits and Muslims. Even worse off than Dalits. I'm not saying that Dalits are not discriminated against. I'm saying that the one, the group that has gained least and lost most from 70 years of Indian independence and economic development are the Adivasis. Yet, their problems are not as actively discussed or debated as the problems of the Dalits or the minorities. And I ask the question, why? Why is this so? And I provide an explanation. And I also argue that because the Adivasis are politically invisible compared to the Dalits, who are discriminated on a daily basis but resist this discrimination and whose discrimination is talked about and articulated by political parties and in some cases by political parties of their own, like the BSP and the Mayavati, the Adivasis do not have a voice in the established political system. They don't have intellectuals and journalists and lawyers taking up their demands. And this has left a massive political and ideological vacuum into which the Maoists have stepped in. So through comparing the predicament with the Dalits, you get a sense of why uh, uh, the areas in which Maoists have made the most advances in the last 15 or 20 years are the Adivasi areas of Chhattisgarh, Orissa, and so on. So that's the first part on politics and society. It's got eight essays. The second part of the book is called Ideologies and Intellectuals. And here I profile seven individual intellectuals, two Western and five Indian. So there are seven portraits of individuals. The Western intellectuals uh, who I write about are uh, the great historian Eric Hobsbawm, and the great political scientist Benedict Anderson, who is a major theorist of nationalism. And the Indian intellectuals I write about include the sociologist Andre Bete, the economist Amartya Sen, and the historian Dharma Kumar. Uh, and also the writer and public intellectual U. R. Anantamurthy. So there are seven essays on individual intellectuals. And here, too, the comparative lens is there. So the essay on Eric Hobsbawm, a great British Marxist historian, it's called, the essay is called, the brilliance and dogmatism of Eric Hobsbawm. The brilliance and dogmatism of Eric Hobsbawm. And I compare Hobsbawm's intellectual and political trajectory with that of an equally great British left-wing historian, E.P. Thompson. Of course, they had intellectual differences. Hobsbawm was a more of an economic historian, Thompson more of a social and cultural historian. But there were also profound political differences. Eric Hobsbawm remained a member of the Communist Party till the day he died. Whereas E.P. Thompson left the Communist Party of Great Britain when the Soviet Union invaded Hungary in 1956. And I argue, by detaching himself from a political party, Thompson was liberated. His intellectual independence was restored. Whereas Hobsbawm, because of his party affiliation, had to, in his historical works, slavishly follow a Marxist or party line. Uh, the essay on Andre Bete, uh, who's a great sociologist living in Delhi and uh, a particular role model and hero of mine, contrasts his career with that of Amartya Sen. Again, they're very interesting similarities and differences. Both are from Bengal, born within a year of each other. Both are public intellectuals, writing for a wide audience. Both are interdisciplinary. Uh, Bete is a sociologist who draws on anthropology and economics and the law. Sen is an economist who is also keenly interested in philosophy and development studies and gender studies. Uh, but there are differences. One lived his life in India, looked outside of the world. The other lived outside, but never forgot his links with India. One was born into the intellectual aristocracy, Amartya Sen, was actually named by Tagore. Uh, the other was, you know, uh, from more humble origins and had a more complicated personal background. So uh, you can see the differences and similarities in these two remarkable intellectuals through this method of com uh, comparison and contrast. So there are eight essays in the second part of the book, seven on individuals, two Western and five Indians. 
And the last essay in the section and in the book is called Where are the conservative intellectuals in India? Where are the conservative intellectuals in India? And it states a paradox and then tries to explain it. And the paradox is this. Alone among the major democracies of the world, India lacks a robust tradition of conservative or right-wing scholarship. This is not true of the United States, of Germany, or the United Kingdom. You know, uh, most democracies, long-standing democracies, have a diversity in their intellectual culture, where you have left-wing intellectuals, far-left intellectuals, moderate-left intellectuals, center-left intellectuals, liberal intellectuals, center-right intellectuals, onto properly conservative intellectuals. Uh, those who would emphasize the importance of religion, family, community uh, in their work. But India lacks this today. We have a right-wing party in power, but virtually no intellectuals of any credibility of whom you can count, you know. Uh, and I'm adopting some uh, fairly, uh, you know, reasonable standards here as to what constitutes an intellectual. Someone who screams on television is not an intellectual. Someone who abuses on Twitter is not an intellectual, right? An intellectual is someone who writes serious books and essays based on research, on reflection. But uh, beyond the research and reflection, there may be your biases that show from a certain perspective. So this is a paradox I'll try and explain. And I say this was not always true in the past. Then I ask, was it always true in the past? And I argue, no. I give three or four names, you could give more. In the colonial period, between 1900 and 1950, there were some first-class Indian historians whom you would count as conservative, R.C. Mazumdar and Jaduna Sarkar among them. You would also have uh, the anthropologist G.S. Gurie, who was a kind of a superb and high-quality sociologist who built a top-class department in Bombay, who was not a liberal, who was not a leftist, whom you would really call a conservative, a small-c conservative. But that is gone. Today, you don't have that. The intellectual world of India is dominated by uh, left-wing and liberal scholars, and I believe that that impoverishes our intellectual life. But why is this so? And I try and answer the question towards the end, and I argue that, you know, this is a, you know, it's to do a lot with the fact that uh, the BJP is so caught up, uh, uh, dominated by the RSS, which is profoundly host hostile to serious work, you know. Uh, and uh, it's only, I argue, that uh, when... Uh, uh, that a conservative intellectual tradition in India can only emerge from outside the ecosystem of the RSS. But I wish it would emerge, because this is a paradox. A right-wing party in power, it's likely to be in power for the next 10 or 15 years. Now, if you look at the other democracies, <coughs> when Margaret Thatcher and the conservatives were in power in Britain for a very long period, I think about 15 years, you had, you had an ecosystem of scholars around the, the conservative party. Serious scholars. You may have disagreed with them, but you would consider them serious scholars. R.C. Bazumdar was a serious scholar. He was a historian with deep research. I may have disagreed with some of his uh, emphases, uh, uh, but that doesn't happen anymore. So you have, uh, we, uh, unlike Britain uh, under Margaret Thatcher or America under Ronald Reagan, where again you had first state tradition of scholarly, reflective work among the Republicans. India today is more akin, may become more akin uh, to the Italy of the 1930s or the Argentina of the 1950s, where you had a right-wing regime in power, uh, but no reflective scholarship. What, the, what, does this, what does this say for our future? You know, will our uh, scholarly, literary, intellectual priorities be defined by people who have contempt for scholarly and intellectual work? Well, this is a question I throw up. And you know, after I wrote the book, I started looking at uh, uh, something I had not uh, thought about, which is compare this present NDA government with the last NDA government. And the contrast becomes even more stri striking. I have said in this book too and in several interviews I've given, I've said that uh, the current regime in Delhi is arguably the most Philistine and anti-intellectual government ever to rule in India. And I would, uh, th that compare that statement uh, is borne out or validated when you compare the current central government with the government run by Mr. Vajpayee, where, you know, if I was to quickly count, at least seven or eight cabinet ministers 
you know, read books or respected people who wrote serious books. I mean, they would include Vajpayee, Advani, Jaswan Singh, uh, Yashwan Sinha, uh, Arun Shori, uh, and among, among, the, uh, among the allies, George Fernandez, Mamta Banerjee, who could recite many Tagore songs, and knows that Nandalal Bose was an artist, you know, he knows that. I'm not sure that Mahesh Sharma, who's our culture minister now, knows that. Right. So that's the last essay, which asks this question, why are there no conservative intellectuals in India, and tries to provide an answer. So that's the book broadly. I want to end with a few remarks on the genre of the long-form essay. You know, I write newspaper columns to make a living. These are 800 or 1,000 words. You have to very quickly make a point. You don't have much time. You know, there's a debate today on Kashmir by tomorrow you have to write an essay. In the old days, today's newspaper was tomorrow's Raddi. That was nicer actually. In to in today, to your column of today, which is written quickly on the fly, uh, where you haven't thought through your arguments uh, very as carefully as you wish, where you have this word constraint of 800 words, that column is alive five years later to be used against you. Five years ago, you praised Nitish Kumar. What about now? Right. He's allying with Lalu Yadav. Right. So, so that's one form of writing that I do. That's the 800 word column, which is in many ways, okay, you have to do it, but it, it has its limits. The other kind of writing I do is to write very long books, uh, which take many years to work out. And, you know, it's an arduous, painful process. And I do, as some of you know, write long books. Uh, a very famous Delhi intellectual, uh, whom I won't name, he may have spoken at Mantham, uh, probably. Or if not, you should invite him to Mantham, I'll tell you his name later. He's a fine and distinguished intellectual, but I don't want to name him uh, for the moment. Some years ago, I met him, uh, about a year after India, Ga after Gandhi had been published, at the Indian International Center, where else. And I was walking, and he was there, and he met. And there was a foreign scholar who was visiting. So he introduced me. And he said, this is Ram. And you know, he said, Ram is the kind of scholar who writes books so big that if you drop them on your foot, your toe will break. <laughs> now, I don't apologize for the length of India after Gandhi. It's a large and complicated country. Crazy country with a tumultuous history. My next book uh, is the second volume of a Gandhi biography, which I'm going to warn you in advance. It long, will be longer than India after Gandhi. And if you drop it on your foot, not your toe, but your ankle might break. All right. So these fat books have sometimes to be written, because I think they are, you can explore a subject in all its nuances. But the essay is somewhere in between. You know, the essay is a release from the large book, and yet 6,000 words allows you to say much more, and hopefully in a more convincing fashion than 600 words, which is what a newspaper column allows you. I'm going to just end with um, a, the quoting and glossing the epigraph to my book, Democrats and Dissenters. And the epigraph says, it's from Benedict Anderson, who was a, uh, Irish by birth uh, and nationality, but a great scholar of Indonesian nationalism. And in many ways, Indonesia was his second nationality. And he says, I quote, no one can be a true nationalist who is incapable of feeling ashamed if her or his state or government commits crimes, including those against her fellow citizens. No one is a true nationalist who is incapable of feeling ashamed if his or her government commits crimes against their fellow citizens. Now, uh, this uh, book went to press seven or eight months ago, before what is happening in Kashmir. But I think uh, this expresses the kind of nationalist I am, you know. That you want, and the kind of nationalist I think many of you are here in this room, though sometimes we are intimidated, intimidated into silence by those on, uh, who think that nationalism means your nation is flawless and immaculate and beyond all criticism. No one is a true nationalist who is incapable of being ashamed if your state commits crimes against your fellow citizens. I mean, a sense of shame is absolutely crucial uh, to being a nationalist. And let me end, uh, since I end with the dedication, I'm going to end with a story about this. Uh, and it's, uh, it comes from um, uh, my former teacher and someone, again, who should speak at Manthan if he hasn't already, uh, the sociologist and public intellectual Shiv Vishwanathan. All of you will know 
that uh, the famous story of how in 1931, when Gandhi went to London for the round table conference, uh, he got off the ship and a journalist asked him, since he had been fighting the British Raj for so many years, a journalist asked him, Mr. Gandhi, what do you think of Western civilization? And he replied, I think that would be a good idea. Right. Now, all of you know this story. Sri Vishwanathan provides a wonderful gloss to this story. He says, supposing Mahatma Gandhi was to be reborn and was to come to India in a spaceship of the kind that are there in some Hindi movies and land in uh, Indira Gandhi airport and say he's come back to his homeland and a journalist put, a TV journalist put a mic in front of him and said, Gandhiji, what do you think of Indian civilization? Gandhi would reply, I think that too would be a good idea. Thank you. Thank you, Ram. Um, as always, you have spoken easily on important issues and uh, in a very accessible manner for somebody who is an academic. I would call you an academic. Uh, also, I must say that I started reading this book uh, two days ago and I was not sure if I would finish it by this evening. Uh, but your writing, as always, has, is so accessible and is so easy that I was able to, in just over a day. You know? uh, so I think that is something that many academics and intellectuals in India don't have, the ability to write on important issues in an easy manner, you know, which is accessible. You may or may not agree, but the point is to get the idea across. So. Thank you for that. <laughs> um, let me begin by asking you to take off from one of the last comments you made about uh, Kashmir. And as you said, there is an essay here on um, comparing Sri Lanka and Kashmir. Now, today, you know, I mean, the essay was written some time ago and revised uh, later. Uh, looking at Kashmir today, I mean, you mentioned that yourself, that A, do you think that time that the rest of India looks at itself and asks whether we have been sensitive enough or even aware about Kashmir. Second, I don't know if you say it in this book or I read it somewhere today, that it's only when there's violence in Kashmir that the rest of India wakes up, you know, and uh, goes to Kashmir and says, look, what can we do? Uh, you also say in your essay that, look, was it, you compare Sri Lanka and Kashmir and say, look, could it have been addressed without taking to arms? But in Kashmir, we've had elections since the late 90s and nothing seems to have uh, changed. Uh, would you like to talk about it a bit yeah. since you've written about this? Hmm? Yeah. I think uh, uh, you made a distinction between uh, the rest of India being aware or being sensitive. And you're right. The rest of India isn't or hasn't for a very long time even been aware of the particular nature of Kashmir. I mean, first of all, uh, the fact that it is special and unique. I mean, we are meeting in Hyderabad, which is the other large state among, among the princely states where there was a problem whether to join the Indian Union. But Hyderabad only had the choice of joining the Indian Union or becoming independent, which was a fantasy. Kashmir had the choice of either joining India or Pakistan because it shared borders with both. And the Maharaja of Kashmir, like the Nizam of Hyderabad, had a fantasy of independence, did not choose either dominion. And then independence happened, the Pakistani uh, army sent raiders and then the Maharaja called the Indian army and acceded under special conditions. So the accession was a special one. And the terms were very clear that they would be... Uh, that they would only give uh, uh, defense, foreign affairs, communication, and currency to the central government. And a lot of that was then taken back. There was Article 370 that was written down. So the first thing is that the, uh, the, uh, the terms of the accession were very, very... Uh, well, Kashmir acceded on special terms, so we have to honor that first. Secondly, uh, the crimes of uh, the government of India and Kashmir have been manifold. I mean, I was shocked to read an article in the Indian Express about four or five weeks ago, before the attack on Uri, but after the trouble in Kashmir started, by a BJP MP, which said the wounds of the Kashmiris are self-inflicted. I mean, I was appalled. We have rigged successive elections. We, uh, we put the popular elected leader, Sheikh Abdullah, in jail for 11 years and never properly tried him. 
you know, we, uh, they imposed the most corrupt regime there. We whittled down Article 370. Wherever the BJP is in power, the, uh, there's a threat that Article 370 will be removed, that Hindu settlers will go there. So it's, it, you know, there are, uh, uh, multiple discriminations against the Kashmiris have been committed by our government in our name. We have not been aware of them. Uh, and maybe if you have been aware of them earlier, maybe we could have more sensitive. But in this world of today, in the internet world, you know about it, right? So that's the issue, firstly. There are complications. One complication is that <coughs> over the last uh, 10 or 15 years, what was a struggle for autonomy, self-respect, and freedom has become increasingly Islamicized. That is an issue, which some Kashmiris don't face. That it's not the struggle of the 50s, the 60s, or 70s. It is inflected with Islam. And the more there is a Hindutva wave in the rest of India, the more the Islamic wave will rise there. I mean, again, what is happening with Gaurakshaks, right? Now, every flogging of a Muslim or a Dalit by a Gaurakshak in the rest of India is now uploaded by video uh, in Kashmir. And they say Muslims are not safe in the rest of India. So there are these various complications. There is also compl the complication of pundits. The expulsion of the pundits is part of the Islamization of the valley. But overall, uh, though... Uh, Kashmiris, Kashmiri activists have quite a lot to answer for. The government of India has much more to answer for. And any step forward will have to be with the recognition of all of this. And as far as the government in power is concerned, Narendra Modi has to clearly disavow the RSS policy. You know that on Article 370 settlers, no, because that is unjust, that is unhistorical, that is, you have to deepen autonomy. And there are many, many things that we have not done. I was in Kashmir in 2015. In 2014, there were really bad floods, right? Now, uh, and no relief came. And the Kashmiris thought, they knew the Congress was corrupt, cynical, and manipulated them. They thought Narendra Modi has come with a clean slate. But absolutely no front relief came for months and months and months. So whenever there is, as Ram says, relatively quiet, we take it for granted. We don't address the serious substantive issues. I mean, even today, uh, the uprising started because Burhan Wani was killed. But behind... Uh, the discontent is not Burhan one is killing. It is 40 or 50 years of, uh, you know, uh, bad policies on our part. So I think, uh, and I think it's, it's very complicated because my view is that also, increasingly I feel it's our responsibility. And I also feel, by the way, that Pakistan uh, is not a party to Kashmir. I think Pakistan has, no longer has a standing in Kashmir because they have, I think, muddied the waters, including by their recent terror attack. But regardless, reg even if Pakistan did not exist, they would be discontent in Kashmir because of what we've done. And I think that is something all Indian Democrats should be worried about. Yeah. Another, to the second half of your book, um, as Ram spoke, the book is really of two halves. One, the first set is a set of issues uh, dealing with um, contemporary issues in India. The second half is about individuals uh, in different ways. Now, one person you didn't speak about in your introduction, if I could ask you to, um, I have two people you didn't speak about, but I'll ask you about one, uh, is about uh, Dharmanand Kosambi. Uh, if I may take a couple of minutes, uh, there's, uh, many of you would know, there was this very well-known, he was really a polyglot. He was a physicist, he was a historian, he was an archaeologist, he was also a Marxist. Um, uh, D.D. Kosambi, you know, uh, the Damodar Dharmanand Kosambi, who, who died, I think, in the late 60s. Most of his work was done in the 50s and 60s. Uh, his father, you know, who to me was unknown until uh, quite recently, is the subject of one essay, a separate essay by uh, Ram. Uh, I wonder if you could uh, talk about him a bit, especially his relationship with Gandhi, you know, which I don't think... Uh, many people are aware of. Yeah. Advantages of the essay form is that you can write about things in which you're interested. You have some knowledge, but you're not a real expert. You know, I couldn't write a whole book on Dharmanand Kosambi, but I could write an essay on him. But like you, I knew nothing about him. I mean, D.D. Kosambi, the mother Kosambi, the son, is a cult figure among Indian left-wing scholars. And I was growing up as a sociology historian, I read him. And I gave a talk in Berkeley uh, where I mentioned him and praised him. And uh, there was a professor in the audience called Padmanava Jaini, who I later discovered is the greatest living scholar of Jainism. He's now 90. So he was then already 70 plus. This is almost 20 years ago. He called me, he said, come to my office tomorrow. I went and he said, you spoke about uh, 
D.D. Koswami, do you know anything about his father? I said, no, sir, I don't know. So then he told me a little bit. And uh, then I explored more. And he told me about how here was a man growing up in Goa, uh, consumed uh, in, middle, uh, uh, in, about in his late 20s. He already had three children, consumed by love, wanted to learn Sanskrit, went to Pune, studied with R.G. Bhandarkar, and then got interested in Buddhism and traveled all around India, Nepal, Sri Lanka, Burma, learning Pali, learning Sanskrit, looking for Buddhist sites, abandoning his children and his wife. And then finally goes back, becomes such an expert on Buddhism that he's invited to Harvard to translate a key Buddhist text called the Vishuddhi Marga, uh, prepare a uh, standard edition, is in Harvard, which is why the son, the mathematician son, studies in Harvard. Actually, his degrees are in Harvard. And then the non-cooperation movement happens, the salt march happens, the call comes, he throws up his job in Harvard, comes, joins Gandhi, goes to jail. And uh, uh, then comes out, influences Gandhi, builds a Buddhist temple, talks to Gandhi about Buddhism, writes standard works on uh, Buddhism in Marathi, which may have influenced B.R. Ambedkar, which is something I talk about. That actually, the first books in Marathi were in, on the Buddha were written by Dharmanand Kosambi. Ambedkar never acknowledges them, although almost certainly would have read them. Now, is it that Ambedkar does not acknowledge them because Dharmanand Kosambi was a follower of Gandhi? That's a question I leave to you. I don't have an answer to that. because, But it's very interesting. Also, another question, which is, did Damodar Kosambi become a Marxist because his father was a Gandhian? You know, that also quite often happens, right? So these are questions you can pose in an essay just in an interesting, teasing way. But then he, he, then he again goes to Gujarat Vidya Peet, you know, uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, teaches Buddhism and Jainism there. And in the 40s, decides in the general way to starve to death. He just says, I'm starting. And this is a fabulous letter here. Should I quote, read that letter? Yeah. This is a lovely letter he writes to Gandhi. Uh, you know, uh, very, very, very starving to death. And I'll just quote, I mean, I think everyone here would know uh, enough Hindustani for me to read it. So he has gone to a Gandhian ashram in, in UP, in Azamgarh, in September 1946, and he's starving to death. So he writes to Gandhi, मैंने पढ़ा है कि आप मालविया जी को मिलने काशी आ रहे हैं इसलिए आपको तकलीफ देना चाहता हूं कि अंतकाल में इन माय लास्ट डेज मैं आपके दर्शन आपके दर्शन हो जाए अभी अभी मेरी हालत बुरी है यस नीतिन को सेवरल वीक्स अभी मेरी हालत बुरी है बहुत कष्ट से बात कर सकता हूं आप आए तो भी शायद बात ना हो सके बाया हाथ बेकार हो गया है माय लेफ्ट हैंड इज गॉन बाकी सब शरीर धीरे धीरे चेतना हीन हो गया है इसलिए आप आने का कष्ट ना उठावे इसमें इसमें गोवा का संबंध कुछ भी नहीं है आशीर्वाद चाहता हूं इसमें गोवा का संबंध नहीं है 1946 इज अ फ्रीडम मूवमेंट टू फ्री गोवा फ्रॉम द पोर्चुगीज ईस्ट ऑफ गोवा इसे इसमें गोवा का संबंध नहीं है सिर्फ आपका दर्शन और आशीर्वाद चाहता हूं गांधी कुंड गो बट ई राइट्स टू मैन से स्टॉप योर फास्ट एंड ई स्टॉप इज फास्ट goes back to Seva Graham and decides that, sorry, I have to go. My life is ended. And he fasts again and dies. And then Gandhi is in Delhi and gives these incredibly moving uh, speeches about, uh, you know, what this man's death meant to him, you know. And it's, it's like an extraordinary relationship. But then he, then he, uh, this is the last part of the essay, which is actually, in a sense, uh, where it comes full circle. Kosambi is dead. Gandhi has three, four months to live. In those three or four months, he writes, writes to Kamalna and Bajaj and one or two others and saying, Raise a scholarship in Dharmanand Kosambi's name to send an Indian student to learn Pali in Sri Lanka. And that's, the trail ends there. And much here, much later, 1997, I met Professor Jaini. I started reading the collected works for Indian Kosambi. In about 2010, I came across an essay of tribute to Professor Jaini on, I think, his 80th birthday, which said, Professor Jaini was the first Dharmanand Kosambi scholar to go to study Pali in Ceylon. Right? The man who had told, and I wrote to him and he very politely said, and he wrote me a lovely letter, right? So it's a, kind of, it's a kind of tribute to two great scholars. I mean, Ram was very kindly said that I write for a general audience. And I think that's a, uh, something which historians and sociologists must do. Uh, and, uh, but I, I think I know real scholarship when I see it. And I'm not that kind of scholar. You know, uh, when I'm reading about Dharmanand Kosambi's um, uh, <coughs> journeys to discover the Buddha and Buddhism. You know, he wrote an autobiography called Nivedan, which is translated in English. You read it. About his struggles, how he takes a second class train, how he files, falls sick, how he goes to Burma and Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka, those carnivorous countries, how does the Goan, how does the vegetarian, how 
Now out time falls sick and suffers. And I'm reading about all this sitting in my study in Bangalore. Uh, think, uh, you know, with my Macintosh machine, thinking I'm going to Delhi next week, I stay in the air conditioned Indian National Center, go to the archive, which is also air conditioned. The, the struggles of a scholar like Dharmanand Kosambi, uh, you know, give you a sense of what really, what the search for scholarship is. So I think, I'm glad you mentioned that essay because I didn't, you know, it's not an essay that uh, is, uh, uh, you know, um, obviously as relevant as the essay on Amartya Sen or freedom of expression. But it's an essay that uh, I learned a lot. And, and I hope, I hope that some Marathi speaking young scholar reads that essay and writes a proper book on Dharmanand Kosambi. I think he deserves it. move to something which you have uh, not addressed uh, in the collection uh, and this is uh, caste hmm? uh, it figures it figures in uh, it figures in his discussion on pasandre uh, bete on anantamurti uh, and elsewhere um, <laughs> it's a big uh, uh, question altogether uh, but you know would you say that uh, this is now one of the central issues uh, in uh, Indian life today, yeah. Indian public life. And maybe a mistake was made uh, in the early 50s, you know, thinking that, look, the constitution has abolished untouchability, so therefore caste disappeared. Uh, the Marxists denied the importance of caste. Academics also said that caste was going away. It's only the past 20 years, it's now in our face, in the face especially of uh, upper caste. Uh, you've written about, you know, ethnic, uh, um, ethnicity of such uh, movements, etc. Uh, but is, do you see in, in any sense, I mean, it's a very big question, that um, our ability to deal with this, rise above, seeing it as a purely ethnic uh, issue, uh, there's a new generation of uh, Dalit uh, leaders who are emerging, especially, I mean, for example, this Jignesh Mevani in Ahmedabad, uh, in Gujarat, who talk about, you know, we have to go beyond looking at it in a certain way, you know. Um, and, and why haven't you really addressed this uh, issue? I know you can't address everything in a book, but, you know, maybe you can talk about it a bit, you know. I think, uh, uh, I think, uh, in the essay on Andre Bete, I make a distinction, or he makes a distinction which I reinforce, uh, between the Dalits and the OBCs. And I think this is a distinction that was lost in the early 90s at the time of the Mandal debate, where the question of affirmative action for Dalits is an issue of social justice, retribution for past wrongs. Affirmative action for OBCs, on the other hand, is a question of balance of power, that the OBCs by the early 90s and the Mandal Commission report, had uh, economic power through land reform, political power through the ballot box and their numbers, but did not have administrative power, which is what they wanted. And uh, at this stage, I mean, I was then a, working and teaching in Delhi where all the debates were, and the Marxists belatedly discovered caste, because they had, as Ram says, it was all caste, class to them. And once they discovered caste, they, were not, they, were, they could not distinguish the OBC problem and SC problem, all the same. And I think this is a very important issue. I think, uh, and Andre Bete's wisdom lane, right, recognizing this, that they, one is about social justice, the other about balance of power. He also said that once the OBCs get administrative power by reservation in the police service, the administrative service, this may lead to greater conflict between Dalits and OBCs, which is happening all over India. Because the Brahmins had left the village long ago. You know, they had become, uh, they had gone to Silicon Valley and they had serving, started serving some other masters. Right. And, so I think this is a real issue, which is still not clearly distinguished in the mind of the Indian left. You know, the Dalit issue is one of social justice and long-standing and endemic discrimination and should not be conflated with the OBC issue, which is about balance of power. So that would be our first... Okay. So, and I think this is a clear distinction that is not recognized adequately. On uh, why I didn't... Uh, Address it in the book. You're right. I mean, a, essay, a book has its limitations. But in the second volume of my Gandhi biography, there'll be a great deal on caste, and on particularly on untouchability and Dalits. And I, I mean, there'll be a very, uh, there'll be probably at close to 100 pages or more on the debate between Gandhi and Ambedkar and what it meant, and uh, 
uh, where I'll try to be fair to both parties. I think, again, just as the problem with the debate on caste, as I see it today, one is that many people haven't discriminated between the Dalit issue and the OBC issue. They're two separate issues. Uh, one is social justice, one is balance of power. I mean, you can see it with the Jat uprising and the, Ma I mean, the Jat uprising in Haryana and the Maratha uprising in Maharashtra is qualitatively different from the movement of the Dalits in Gujarat or what happened in Hyderabad after the tragic suicide of Rohit Mahbula. I mean, but, uh, let's, let's be clear about this. And, and uh, obviously, you know, one's empathy and sympathy is far more with the Dalit uprising in Gujarat or in Rath than that. So that's one. But also, the second issue is with Gandhi and Ambedkar. What I've tried to do is to write about that debate and the whole problem of untouchability and discrimination against Dalits in a way in which it is fair to both parties. I think the other problem with intellectual and political discourse is that, you know, one is uh, uh, some people used to praise Gandhi to diminish Ambedkar. Now it's the reverse. You praise uh, Ambedkar to diminish Gandhi. And I try to argue, uh, I try to show that both were quite remarkable people approaching the problem of different vantage points. One was an upper caste guilt-ridden reformer. The other was a, a Dalit himself, who was an emancipator of the Dalits. Clearly, they had different perspectives, different agendas. But from the larger point of view of Indian society and Indian history, actually, they were complementary. And I think that's something, it's a, I hope this is a position that people, more and more people come to see. But uh, one of the reasons it's not there in this book very much is because in the, my Gandhi biography, it'll be a central issue. Because it, and again, it's very interesting. You know, it's very interesting that uh, just as the Marxists took such a long time, so did the nationalists. When Gandhi said that uh, Swaraj will not come unless we abolish untouchability, he had no support within the Congress party. I mean, Nehru and Patel, none of them thought this is important. They said, what is all this Harijan uh, stuff, you know? The only congressman who understood it was Rajaji, to some extent, right? Then, after Gandhi died, what did the so-called Gandhians do? Uh, Vinoba Bhave never talked about it. I mean, he talked about cow slaughter. He talked about prohibition. But had he, he never even talked about Hindu-Muslim harmony. I mean, if, if the, the two core issues for Gandhi were socialist so Hindu-Muslim harmony and abolition of untouchability. And, of course, finally, what I'll try and show is con it's very easy to cherry pick Gandhi, to pick out one quote from here and, you know, as is now happening with his, in Ghana. In 1893, Ghana was a, Gandhi was a racist. In 1893, Gandhi was 24, he was an upper caste Gujarati educated in London and he was a racist. But by 1910, he had stopped being a racist. And by the 1920s and 30s, he was advising civil rights activists in America who went on to inspire Martin Luther King. Now, the activists in Ghana will never talk about all this because you can quote him in 1893 and say he's a racist, full stop. Right. Similarly with caste, Gandhi's views on caste evolved over a 20-year period. And you quote him from 1920 and say, defend the Dharma, this is not true by the 1940s. So I think the tragedy of this whole, I, I think we need Gandhi and Ambedkar both. We needed them then and we need them today because I think the, the fight against untouchability, again, that is the... And discrimination against Dalits. That is a core, that is like Kashmir, a dark, or the treatment of tribals, or the attacks on women. It is one of the dark spots of Indian democracy. And we, that, uh, all, but it must not be conf conflated with the OBC question, which is f far very different, or not, uh, it's not of the same, you know, on, should not be put on the same page here. One brief uh, question. Uh, I mentioned this to you before, your uh, ability to pull out these nuggets from the archives. I don't know how uh, you strike it rich. Uh, but this exchange of correspondence between Nehru and JP, um, which again I, I was not aware of. Um, there is a chapter on, on JP actually, uh, but it discusses correspondence between JP and Nehru in the 50s and I think goes on to the 60s. Maybe you could uh, talk about that and what secrets you have to unearth uh, such in, in interesting information. You know, uh, the golfer Gary Player uh, once, was once accused of being a lucky golfer. And he said, the harder I practice, the luckier I get. Right. So historians have to dig deeper. It's hard work. Right. Too many historians uh, are just read books or read fancy theoretical books. I mean, the latest French thinker, you know is what attracts them. History is an empirical discipline. Anthropologists do field work, historians work in the archives. So when I'm in an archive, you know, uh, wherever it may be, it may be Nagpur, Mumbai, Delhi, London, 
I am there from when it opens at 9 to then it closes at 6, six o'clock. And I'm reading and taking notes. I also very rarely Xerox, you know. I mean, because I think, you know, they are, when I'm sitting in an archive, uh, sometimes someone will come with a large grant from an American university and microfilm the whole collection and take it back. And it'll be sitting in his desk for the last five, next five years, you wouldn't have seen it, right? So I think you read, take notes, go back. I mean, I think history is an empirical discipline. And then the resources available for a modern historian, it may be more difficult for a medieval historian. If you want to uh, research 16th century or 17th century Hyderabad, maybe the Persian manuscripts don't exist or they are all lost or stolen, right? But for a historical 20th and 20th century, the resources are immense, uh, particularly in Delhi, but also the. And so in a sense, I, 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 I love going to archives. I mean, that is really uh, uh, what gives you the greatest thrill. And or the archive, like you just, I went through these papers, and uh, there was so much, this J.P. Nehru thing was so rich. And it had, you know, neither uh, J.P.'s uh, biographers or no, Nehru's biographers had kept look at it. And it's a debate about, uh, it's a debate about, uh, you know, is democracy about just winning elections? Is it about more than winning elections? If someone wins an election, is the dominant party, uh, do they have a moral right to be criticized or assessed? Or are they beyond all criticism? Uh, is democracy more meaningful at the federal level or decentralized from, you know, from the village up? So it's a fascinating debate about all these questions. You know, they, they actually, uh, it's very interesting, Ram. I mean, I, this is a short piece, but the J.P. Nehru relationship is incredibly interesting and moving. There are many more letters that, that, that are there. Uh, which, uh, and one aspect is, when it's personal, they switch to Hindi. When it's intellectual, they write, they debate in English. You know, it's very interesting. So sometimes he writes, in, I'm not, sometimes he writes him a Hindi letter. You know, JP is not well. So when JP is not well, he writes him a letter, kya ho raha and he'll also reply in Hindi, koi baat nahi, karo. I mean, they, they, some, so when they're personal things, they're in Hindi. And when it's a intellectual thing, they want to do it in English. I mean, it's, I, maybe they're more comfortable because, uh, you know, they've read all the debates of the great political thinkers. But, uh, 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 actually, again, these are things that, just as I said, someone should write a book on Dharmanand Kosami. There's another great book to be written. And uh, the, that is on by a younger scholar, maybe in this audience. And this is on the richness of the political debates of the 50s. Okay. We know the richness of the political debate 20s and 30s. We know Gandhi and Ambedkar, Gandhi and Patel, you know, Tilak and Gokhale, right? We, th but if you look at the debates between Loya and Rajagopalachari on the imposition of Hindi, uh, between J.P. and Nehru on socialism, Kriplani, you know, uh, the Marxists and Nehru. I mean, they're really, I mean, the intellectual debates, and there were some really considerable figures. I mean, uh, J.P. and Nehru are two, but E.M.S. Tampudripad, uh, Shama Prasad Mukherjee, uh, uh, J.B. Kriplani, Rajaji, Loya. I mean, these were really thinker activists, uh, and I think, there's a great book to be written. Though the Congress was uh, ruling in all the states and at the center, it was not hegemonic, hegemonic at the level of ideas. It was hegemonic at the level of control of governments. But at many of the challenges at the level of ideas, from people like Loya and Rajagopalachari, were later to find traction in the politics of the 70s and 80s. And there's a great book to be written on actually pol debates within and among politi politicians uh, in the 50s, of which that short chapter on JP and uh, uh, Nehru is just a glimpse. I mean, some younger scholars should really dig much deeper into this. Yeah. Hello. Uh, sir, you've talked about conservative intellectuals. So, I personally feel that this is an oxymoron. I, I, don't, mean, I don't mean to say it uh, sarcastically. I actually want to know what you think of it. Are there any conservative intellectuals? Okay. And they are. They should be and they are. If you could, uh, if you buy my book. All right. Okay. I have a long section. I have a long section. I hope you buy my book. I read the essay. There's a long section on a very fine British conservative intellectual who's a philosopher called Roger Scruton. Who, you know, who, you see, uh, uh, what uh, the hallmark of a conservative intellectual uh, is that they warn against too quick and too rapid change. Leftists are trying to transform the world very quickly and sometimes leave a debris of violence and dead bodies in their wake. So don't do things too fast, watch. Conservative intellectuals are also very skeptical of the state. Leftists think the state is emancipatory and building welfare for all. And conservative intellectuals tell you that no, sometimes the state can become 
uh, can become an autonomous center of power by itself. Conservative intellectuals tell you that family, tradition, even religion have their space, and you should. So I think there, there, there is space for you know high quality conservative intellectual work, as happened in many parts. Edmund Burke, whom you could also read, who is a, you know, he's a classic great conservative intellectual of the 18th and early 19th centuries. So by saying conservative intellectual is an oxymoron, with due respect, madam, you are displaying your leftist bias. Uh, before the next question, two announcements. One is, uh, this wonderful book is out for sale uh, just outside. Uh, after this question answer session, please pick up the book, get it autographed by Ram Guha. Uh, that's a great read that you will have. The second uh, announcement is uh, that we have all of you who have registered for Manthan Samvad, uh, please be there at JRC Convention Center at 8.45 next Sunday, 2nd October. Uh, for now, the registrations are closed. We are uh, packed. If we have some cancellations, we'll be able to accommodate some people. But otherwise, we are packed to, the, um, to our limit. Thank you. Good evening, sir. Uh, sir, recently there was a face-off between the BJP and TRS about uh, the September 17th event. The BJP wanted September 17th to be celebrated as the Hyderabad Liberation Day and the TRS said they wanted to celebrate it as Telangana Merger Day. But uh, I, this kind of appropriation of history to suit political ideologies, uh, uh, are you trying to counter this in your writings and do you talk about it? Uh, and uh, second thing is, when, we, uh, when, we, when I read school textbooks like the NCRT books, when we say modern Indian history, modern Indian history ends with uh, the Indian, India's independence at 1947. And if anybody wants to know what happened after 1947, I have to refer to polity textbooks. So I think, uh, is it possible to separate history and polity to know about India? And second thing, when I really uh, looked at this question on reflection, I feel there should be separate histories written because the history on the whole from the pre-colonial time, it's not totally representing everyone. The Adivasi, the, the Northeast uh, Indian history, women, Dalits, and even the Goa independence movement, I haven't re read about it much, much about it. So uh, what are universities doing about this? Yeah. And, say, and one, more, one more question. I mean, just one more, one, just one more question. That's just that's one that's more that's question. That's <laughs> Why, why is nobody not objecting to this article in the constitution about uh, Hindi uh, that should be promoted as a uh, national language? Why is nobody ob objecting to it? It should be just an official language. We don't have a national language. You shouldn't have a national language. Uh, you know, uh, uh, history is not a science. But history is not pure ideology either. See, history is somewhere in between. History is a craft. Um, the great Dutch historian Peter Gale said, history is an argument without end. But it's a craft. So to understand, you can't make up facts. You have to, as Ram and I discussed, do research in diverse range of archives to find out all the depth and the diversity. But it's never definitive. You know, somebody will do deeper research, contest your arguments, have a different perspective. You know, uh, till uh, 50 or 60 years ago, women were excluded largely from historical narratives. So were Dalits and the poor. All that is changing. But uh, it's also used and abused by people in power. Now, uh, I mean, I don't know the details of September 17th, but, but an example of how it's used and abused by people in power is the invocation by Narendra Modi and the BJP of Sadar Patel as a great leader. Right. Now, as uh, uh, one of my wise friends put it, why did this happen? How could this happen? It happened, the Congress disowned Patel. Patel was a lifelong congressman. He was never in any other party and he built the Congress, state by state and district by district. But because the Congress under Sonia Gandhi only had room for the family, they disowned Patel, whereupon the BJP misowned Patel. <laughs> right. So this is a game that is played on. You know, in America, they'll be fighting over who, what was Lincoln. Uh, for example, now in America, there's an interesting fight that is unresolved. Hoot, they want a new face on the, on the note. So the Republicans want Ronald Reagan because they say there are too many Democrats. The Democrats will want one more Democrat. So these are debates that go on. At the, so history will always be a political football. But when it comes to scholars, 
A history is a craft based on research. You can't make up facts. Again, with due apologies, I'm mentioning Narendra Modi again. Narendra Modi made up that Nehru was not there at Patel's funeral, which is a total lie. It's a total lie, not his fault. He had an illiterate speechwriter, right? Okay. Uh, I mean, obviously, somebody told you that, right? So, it's, you can't make up things, but you have to string them together in a kind of coherent argument. The last point you made is no longer true. India after Gandhi is a history of India after 1947. That book came out 10 years ago. Now, many younger scholars are writing about the 50s and the 60s and the 70s. So, the, the history of post-independent India is a growing field uh, and uh, a field that will develop further and further as the years go on. Uh, th that was an uh, illuminating talk with a lot of anecdotes. Actually, I have two questions, sir. The first question is, uh, you know, I want to ask the historian in you. Recently, I read an article which said that, I mean, because of the uh, US elections and everything is going on. So the next president, as much as he needs economic uh, council of advisors, he should also have a historical a council of historical advisors. You know, as a historian, what do you see, uh, uh, what kind of merit do you see in that idea, number one? And the second question is, recently I read an article in the Financial Times, which had a couple of 30 plus questions. It's called, uh, the title is the question paper for the future. Say, if a student is answering these questions in the year 2066, 50 years later, one of the questions among many, like Obama managed orderly decline of American power, one of the questions was, Narendra Modi is the new face of India. Is he or is he not? So, uh, I mean, as a historian, just uh, it should be. Please, uh, can you please give your insights on these two questions? So, I, the good Thank questions, you. and I'm clear. Uh, the answer to the first question is no. That's a crazy idea. Historians, in my view, must stay away from policy and must stay away from prophecy. <laughs> historians are not astrologers. Uh, they are scholars and craftsmen who write for understand. They must. If you start advising a politician, I, I mean, uh, it, it's maybe vanity and delusion. The same historian, Neil Ferguson, who wants a council of historical advisors, is one of the historians who told George Bush, go into Iraq and you'll be welcomed as a liberator. He's one of those historians. Right. So look at the track record of historians advising politicians, what happens. Don't trust us with anything but writing for issue things which you can debate with a disagree. Please, I mean, historians should stay far away from policy making and even further away from prophecy. Yeah. Yeah. Sir, very, very sweet. Good evening. A lot of knowledge you have given. So my question was, how is the future of India? I am not an astrologer, sir, so I can't get this. Hi, thank you. <coughs> uh, I am Dr. Chakravarti, a retired civil servant. Um, my compliments to you, Ram, uh, for your lucid presentation of your book or books, I would say. Um, I have only a very brief uh, intervention here. Um, in our country today, which is heterogeneous, caste, community, religion, and what have you, creed, it's a heterogeneous society. But the move today is to have homogeneity. What you should eat, what you should read, what film should you see, and so on and so forth towards homogeneity is there. I am reminded of a biological maxim which says homogeneity leads to extinction. Heterogeneity leads to evolution. What are your thoughts? That's a very profound and important question. Uh, um, broadly, I'm on your side. Uh, uh, and I would like to provide a historical perspective, because I think this is imperfectly understood. In many ways, this is the argument of India after Gandhi, that we are, an, I say, we are an unnatural nation. Because unlike other nations, we don't base our nationhood on a single religion or a single language. And in many ways, that's a contribution of Mahatma Gandhi. And, it, and Mahatma Gandhi himself was made aware of the heterogeneity of India. 
linguistic, religious, cultural, by living in the diaspora. Because he lived in South Africa, he got a sense of all of this. And that is really a great strength. I mean, and that's the only way we can survive. And um, the you know, questions about what to, uh, as you say, it's not just that we want to impose a single religion or a single language. Somebody talked about Hindi chauvinism a little earlier, but about what we can eat, what we cannot eat. You know, uh, uh, I think these are these are deeply worrying things. And I think uh, it also comes from fear. It comes from a fear that the country will make up desh ka batwara ho jayega. If you allow people to speak different languages and different religions, you know, but I think actually the only way we can stay together is being so diverse. And I think that is the special characteristic of being an Indian. And uh, uh, if you look at, just look at our neighbor, Pakistan was create, uh, created on the basis of religion, but it broke on the question of language because Jinnah went to Dhaka and his first speech in Dhaka, he said, you Bengalis have to learn Urdu. Right. Now, Oh, look at Sir. So I think these are some of the lessons around us, and I completely agree with you uh, that uh, in heterogeneity is our strength. I mean, I think uh, uh, in Gandhi's view of the, uh, there's something else. I mean, uh, which is linked to this. Again, this is, uh, uh, you know, among the distinctive features of Indian nationalism was that it did not privilege a religion, a language, or a common enemy. I think that's an underappreciated fact of the greatness and distinctiveness of the Gandhian view of nationalism. Gandhi did not hate the British, and we are better off for that. I think that he, he hated imperialism. But he, he said, and he, Gokhale before him said, you know, an Englishman can become an Indian citizen. I mean, a common friend of uh, Ram and mine is Jean Dres, who is India's finest development economist, and he was born a Belgian. But he is more Indian than you or me. I mean, he has tracked through more the parts of India than anyone in this hall. I, I can tell you for sure, right? So I think this is the appealing part of being an Indian, that there is no single essence. And uh, clearly, uh, you know, uh, Golwal, if you read Golwalkar, I've been reading Golwalkar, who's like, uh, you know, the, the mentor of the RSS. He is really a Hindu jinnah. He is paranoid that if everyone does not speak Hindi, we'll break up into 30 parts. You know, it's a kind of a paranoid, insecure form of nationalism that uh, stretches homogeneity. And the example of Pakistan and Sri Lanka is there for us to see. What happens when you have a homogeneous model of nationalism? Yeah. Sir, uh, if somebody has to know history, they will never know the facts if I have to go by historians, like you or anybody else. I get the perspective of the fact you understand. So what is the perspective that you are trying to bring that you've decided when you said you'll be fair to Ambedkar and Gandhi? What is it that you've decided? Uh, so it, it is not the fact, it's the perspective. Yeah. That which is now in the past was once in the future. So when I'm looking at Gandhi and Ambedkar, I'm looking at it at that time, from the, when they first met in 1931, what is the context of 1931, not what I know in 2016, or what am I prejudiced in 2016. And from 1931 till Gandhi's death in 1948, they have many encounters, direct, indirect, in person, uh, through writings, through the writings of their colleagues, both appreciative and critical, commentary around them, and you, if you trace it carefully and chronologically, as they unfolded at the time, you are fair to both. Because you are placing them in their time. Not for the perspective of today and your, your, your new knowledge, your hindsight, your biases. Right. Uh, so that's the first thing. The second thing is that there are some choices we have to make. Between Gal Gandhi and Golwalkar, you have to choose. You have to choose. Okay. There are some choices clearly you have to make. Uh, because one stands for heterogeneity, one stands for homogeneity. Right? There are two totally competing views of nationalism. Between Gandhi and Ambedkar, you don't have to choose. You can choose to admire one person more than the other. Fine. You know, I admire, somebody admires Ambedkar more than Gandhi, fine. But they were both extraordinary people. Both were committed to the abolition of untouchability, firstly, from different perspectives. Secondly, both had many other aspects to their life than the battle against untouchability. You cannot view Ambedkar merely from the lens of being an emancipator of the Dalits. Ambedkar was a great thinker of federalism. 
Ambedkar was a legal scholar who designed a gender uh, equal laws. You cannot view Gandhi similarly simply from the lens of being an upper caste, guilt ridden reformer and an eligibility. No one did more than Gandhi to promote, live for, and die for Hindu Muslim uh, or broadly religious harmony. Right? His theory of non violent resistance has inspired movements all over the world and has been much more successful in the long term in nurturing democratic regimes than violent revolutions. So they're both extraordinary figures. You don't have to choose between them. You can rank one above the other. Fine. That is a matter of personal preference. But I think it's doing a great disservice to them and to us today to uh, exalt Gandhi at the expense of Ambedkar or vice versa. People do both. People do both. And, you know, I've written about both kinds of, uh, uh, you know, ideological uh, uh, kind of uh, upgradation of one at the expense of the other. That's what I mean. But as a historian, I want to see how it unfolded over time. And as I'll explore chronologically, carefully, every meeting, encounter, debate that took place from 1930 to 1948, you'll get a sense. And I hope, though my book is a thousand pages, I hope you read it. If only for this, since you're interested in the subject. That is, we really don't have to choose. This is a way in which they were both extraordinary people. As I said, you may be more attracted to one than the other. So that can happen often, right? I mean, it can happen, you know, you look at the debates uh, in any field. I mean, in my generation, are you a Gavaskar fan or a Vishwanath fan? Why do you have to choose? Right? I mean, in that same way, they were both great Indian Democrats. And India would have been impoverished if we had not had both. Sir, good evening, sir. Sir, uh, in one of your earlier works, you had uh, spoken about the 10 uh, factors which would destabilize India. Ah, in the, oh. Reasons that would not, why, 10 reasons ah. why India must not and should not be a superpower. That's yeah. what I said. Sir, one thing is uh, the demand for smaller states. Sir. And uh, realizing this, that we are living in a hostile neighborhood, your uh, view on this, sir, the demand for smaller states. I mean, realizing that we are living in a hostile neighborhood. You know, those are two separate questions. Uh, I don't think uh, making smaller states is a question of foreign policy. It's not how to deal with Pakistan. It's how to deal with ourselves. Uh, the USA has 400 million people and 50 states. We have 1.3 billion people and 29 states, right? So I think th they're separate questions. I think uh, uh, we live in a hostile neighborhood, yes. But smaller states, broadly, I think, in terms of governance, my view. But I'm, I, I'm <coughs> open to debate and argument on this. We should have a debate on this. You know, at a certain point in our history, linguistic states saved our unity. I think Patti Siramulu was a great uniter of India. Because otherwise we would have gone the Sri Lanka way. We needed space for our great languages. Tamil, Kannada, Malayalam, Odia, Gujarati to have their own political boundaries to evolve. But now we are safe and secure. We are not going to break up. If Saurashtra wants to break up from Gujarat tomorrow, it is not going to help Pakistan in any way. For example, right? And it's not going to be. Now we are, we are, you know, we are. India is secure. We live 70 years, and maybe 40 states based on rational principles. You know, I think. Uh, Dr. Manmohan Singh had promised a second state's reorganization commission, uh, but he lacked the courage to implement it. And the first state's reorganization commission had three people, not one of them was a politician. There was a jurist, a historian, and a, and a legal specialist, right? Uh, sorry, and, and a social worker. So I think smaller states delegate from the hostile neighborhood. My view is if you have a Credible states reorganization commission composed, you know, get Mr. Y.B. ready to share it, he's sitting here, right? People like him, you know, there'll be others like John Therese, whom I mentioned, people who understand India's economy, geography, society, and can tell you these would be, should be the boundaries. If Gorkha land is divided, this is what will happen. If Vidarbha is created, this is what could happen. UP, I mean, UP is a disaster. UP has to go into four or five parts. And Mayawati is the only politician who had the courage to mention it. No other party mentions it. Because they want to grab the whole state and 80 MPs, because you have four states, you have to campaign in four states. But UP is 200 million people. 
it is the poorest and worst governed state in India, partly because it is one state. So I think there is a strong, in my view, there is a strong case, but I think the political will is lacking, uh, to have a reasonable, careful discussion as to how many states India needs and which of our states can be break, broken up. Maybe some states don't need to be broken up. It's possible that Gujarat is fine. But UP shortly has to be broken up into four or five. I mean, there's no question about it. Yeah. So, uh, as an economist and uh, uh, the sociologist and a historian, I would like to, I would like you to, and an author, huh. I would like you to uh, comment on the decline of communism and the debate about uh, end of ideology and the in the present context. No, I think uh, ideology is not ended uh, at all, but communism is on the decline both in this country and globally. And I personally don't mourn that decline. Okay. Having said that, I think Marx was a great thinker. You know, Marx is not to be confused uh, with those who speak in his name. Marx famously said, I am not a Marxist. <laughs> right. Marx was a great thinker whose ideas on social inequality, on the functioning of the state, on economic systems are still relevant. But communism, as a one-party system, is irrelevant. I mean, one of the most uh, remarkable statements made by, uh, by, in the last 10 or 15 years, by an Asian politician was when Prachanda, the Nepali Maoist, came over ground and said, multi-party system, multi-party democracy is the political system most suited to the 21st century. And he, I wish uh, the Indian Maoists would listen to this. So in that sense, as a political philosophy where one party state run by a central committee which is overseen by a politburo which is overseen by one dictator whether you call him Mao or Comrade Ganapati or whatever you or Lenin or whatever you want to call him right that is history has shown and sociology has shown that is profoundly detrimental to democracy that's clear but Marx was a great thinker so don't throw out the baby with the bathwater you know Marx can still tell you things uh, that 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 will help you yeah Um, can you hear? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Your essay. Don't move the mic. Don't move the mic. Is there, is there one more mic? Maybe there is no range. Huh? Yeah. Range. Come closer. Yeah. Is it better? Yeah. yeah. I read your essay on the conservative intellectuals in the caravan, and I haven't yeah. read it in the book. Yeah. Um, but my question is, much of what you uh, speak about as intellectualism is really based around Delhi um, or uh, Bombay. Um, why is this so? No, no. I think uh, I myself don't live in Delhi. <laughs> That's the first thing. Uh, it's, uh, some of the people, men many of the people mentioned in, in that essay are not from Delhi. So the conservative intellectuals of the past, uh, you know, Mazumdar, Guria were not from Delhi. But it is also true that uh, uh, Delhi has, uh, is a center of Indian intellectual life. You know, I think uh, Delhi University, JNU, Jamia, uh, and some research institutes, Institute of Economic Growth, CSDS, uh, have unfortunately become, uh, you know, uh, I mean, I think it's good now that you work here and HCU is here and we must, you know, diversify. I think that's one of the limitations of Indian intellectual life is that it is too dominated by Delhi. I mean, uh, without question, I think um, part of, see, again, you see, uh, the important lesson of history, people ask me what are the lessons of history, and what are the, they're not, you know, they're not, they're not the kind that you can advise politicians about, but one of the lessons of history is that change is never unilinear. Linguistic states was good in many respects and not so good in some respects. You know, that is, one of the, I talk, they saved the unity of India, they gave dignity and pride to linguistic communities. But they parochialized our universities. Bombay University uh, once had professors from all over India. So did Madras University. But they now only Tamils here, one place, and Maharashtra in the other place. And that is part, so I think this, and hence you need to have 
new sanctuary university is like HCU or whatever else, right? Or Pondicherry University. So one of the consequences was that uh, Delhi University, JNU, Jamia became the three default national universities because these were all parochialized. Once uh, Calcutta University is a state university under the control of the West Bengal state government, the patronage of the ruling party comes in. And of course, local politics, you know, it's always easier for a Bengali to live in Bengal and so on and so forth. But if you look at in the colonial period, Madras University, I mean, had a great department of art run by Devi Prasad Roy Chaudhary. Uh, I mean, th and there are many examples like this. You know, Calcutta, Radha Krishnan taught in Calcutta. C.B. Raman taught in Calcutta. So I, I think this is one of the costs of uh, uh, linguistic states. And I think slowly we are beginning to uh, address that. Yeah. I have a question. Uh, during the time of emergency, it was state policy to suppress dis dissent. At the time of emergency, it was the state policy to suppress dissent. And anyone who was dissenting was put inside. Or Now we don't have a state policy to suppress dissent. But which is worse? Uh, well, I think the emergency was worse. I lived through it. And I lived through it in Delhi, where it was at its worst. So, uh, without doubt, uh, uh, we are freer now than we were in the MNC, but we are much less free than we should be, you know, uh, or what the cons maker of the constitution hoped for us to be. And I have an essay in this book which outlines eight threats to freedom of expression. And when I say uh, intellectuals, writers, artists, filmmakers are more vulnerable, more prone to threat than at any time since the emergency. But the ad emergency was unquestionably worse. I mean, I have no, it was awful. You know, so we are nowhere near that. I mean, and I got into trouble because when the JNU issue happened, I said this. Because everyone was talking about fascism and so on. I said, you know, hyperbole never helps your case. You know, exaggeration, hyperbole never helps your case. The emergency was far worse. I could not have been giving a talk like this even in Hyderabad during the emergency. Uh, good evening, sir. I'm Thomas. I'm a Manthanite. Um, uh, we had uh, many statesmen in India. One being Vivekananda who was uh, bothered about uh, more uh, bigger issues than independence itself, uh, unity of uh, some, something. And uh, Nehruan and Gandhian, they were both uh, great world leaders. But I would like to tell about, ask about one leader uh, who actually uh, gave me a packet of uh, Nestle noodles. In 1984-85, he was actually launching the Nestle. And his uh, producers, they started talking about Swadeshi, Swadeshi, Swadeshi product. And now they are going Videshi, Videshi. I'm, talking of, I'm telling about Mr. Vajpayee, who handed me the packet of Nestle in 1984-85 in Kendra Vidyalaya AMC Center. Now, my question is, tell us something about Vajpayee as a Gandhian and a Nehruian. And uh, one more thing is, BJP originally originated from the Congress e under some other form, as a socialist, as a separate group. So, as a, Vajpayee as a Gandhi and Nehru, and I want that. Vajpayee, <laughs> you know, uh, again, you know, this is the, uh, one of the, I don't know what you want to call it, uh, hazards of growing old or older, that if you look at Narendra Modi, it makes you nostalgic for Vajpayee. And if you look at Rahul Gandhi, it makes you nostalgic for Indira Gandhi. <laughs> right, okay. So, you know, in that, we, while we lived under them, through them, we thought they were horrible. But now, in reflection, you see some interesting aspects of them. He was a very intriguing and interesting figure. You know, I think uh, he was, had more subtle, more nuance uh, than the BJP leaders of today. Uh, but he was reared within the Sangh Parivar. So he deviated a little bit. He could call him a soft Hindutva and not hard Hindutva. You know, he admired Nehru, not Gandhi. I don't think he ever. I've never heard him say anything in, in praise of Gandhi. No, that is just briefly they used it and then they abandoned it. In 1980, they started their policy as Gandhi. Within three months, they had forgotten it, and they went back to the hardcore Jansang RSS point of view. Right. So, uh, you know, he would be a very interesting figure for a biography. Again, you know, some young scholars should do it. Uh, and they, I mean, I think, as I said, he was a soft Hindutva person. That he sort of subscribed to the philosophy, 
but not to its rough and brutal edges. For example, uh, there are several examples of this. One is in, uh, in 1966, 50 years ago, you know, because all this Gauraksha stuff is happening, there was a, Indira Gandhi had just come into power, she was very weak. So the RSS organized a massive demonstration in front of uh, parliament on November 7th, 1966, demanding ban on cow slaughter. And with the inflammatory speeches by, you know, those, the sadhus who are now like the sadhvi and the types, and they marched on parliament. And Vajpayee was caught saying on the microphone, mat jau, mat jau, mat jau. They marched on parliament, they were repulsed by the police, they went into parliament street, they burnt the houses of Kamaraj and Sheikh Abdullah. And the army was called out for the first time since 1947. So Vajpayee wasn't the meeting, but said, mat jau. Similarly, after the demolition of Babri Masjid, he said, he said, yeah, tumne galat kya. And then he was told to shut up and he was not, he could not speak for a few months after that, right? So his instincts were not, let's say, as, he was not as dogmatic. But he was not a Nehruvian, he was not a Gandhian. He was, as he said in New York, main swayam sevak hoon. He said that in New York. Yeah. Uh, one question there. Hi, sir. So I have one question. Uh, it was uh, really enthralling uh, for overall the discussion. So at the end, uh, one question which uh, bothers me throughout, not because of the session, rather. Uh, after so many good things and so many uh, good leaders, even after independence of close to whatever, almost 60, 70 years, why in key human development indexes, India is still lagging far and far, and if I take few names, like many of the aspects, even we are far beyond Bangladesh, the countries which we take so many negative comments. So why it is so, even after so many able leaders and is some way that somebody talked about diversity, is some way, I think that the concept of unity in diversity is overhyped in India's context. I'm going to do something uh, uh, slightly naughty, but it's appropriate. I'm going to ask Ram Reddy to answer that question. Since he knows the subject much better than me, actually. That's what I'm going to say. About human development. <laughs> no, I, uh, I can only say that you know, you're asking fundamental questions about why India is still a, a poor country. I mean, just the human development alone, um, it's supposed to cover, in a very narrow sense, health and education. Okay? Uh, and you spoke about Bangladesh. You know? Now, Bangladesh, for example, has shown that in certain areas, it has been able to do much more than India, uh, especially in terms of infant mortality, maternal mortality, etc. Uh, and, uh, and Sri Lanka, for example, they started much earlier. And very recently, they have announced the eradication of malaria. I mean, you can't say that in a small state they could do it, we can't do it in, uh, you know, even one state in India, it has not been possible. These are things that just with public action, government commitment, you know, this could have been done. Okay? And those were not done, you know. Why those are not done, that's, I mean, that's something that get into a different uh, area. Uh, but certain things which were doable, you know, could have been, they didn't seem to be important priorities, you know, especially health and education. And now we are beginning to take it up, but perhaps, you know, not in an adequate way. But there's a much larger question, which we won't get into, I don't know, about you basically saying, why are we still poor? You know, I mean, I, it's, well, we need uh, half a dozen books for to answer that, try and answer that question. I just had a footnote to what uh, Ram said by way of explanation, what Ram said is, and that, which is just a theory, a speculation, which has to be documented. And that's to do with, as Ram rightly said, caste is a major issue that should, I should have discussed more and all of us should have discussed more. You know, again, this is pure speculation, Ram, that to some extent there is caste in Bangladesh, because South Asian Muslims also practice caste, but less, much less. To some extent, there is caste in Sri Lanka because the Buddhists also have a little bit of caste. But it's not as endemic or deep-rooted in India. And this is a subject for a proper sociologist to spend his or her whole life doing. 
is the caste system, does it have something to do? You said it's the scale and the largeness. But does the caste system have to do something with our horrible outcomes in education and health? The fact that uh, historically, you know, only Brahmins were given access to education. That historically, uh, upper caste were given access to the clean water source and the lower caste had to go. You know, I, I wonder, yeah, is this reproduced in the way we run our public... I mean, this is a really interesting question. I don't know whether anyone has seriously answered this. I just wonder. This also could be a, one of the reasons why our human development indicators are so bad here. Yeah. I'll ask a question, Aram. Your book is about Democrats and dissenters. You've talked of Gandhi, you've talked of Ambedkar, but we haven't heard anything today about Nehru. What was really Nehru? Was he a great Democrat who built this country, or was he one who, who was the cause of all ills? Today, Nehru is as vilified as uh, anyone else. So what, what is your view about Nehru? You know, uh, I'll give it briefly. It would not be fair not to answer the question. But one of the reasons Nehru doesn't figure in this book is that in my last collection of essays, Patriots and Partisans, there's a 30-page essay on Nehru, which is called Verdicts on Nehru, the Rise and Fall of a Reputation, which tries to understand why was a man so greatly venerated in his time, so demonized today. And, uh, I mean, again, so hopefully somebody will read that essay, and I, I can send you a copy of there. But uh, he was an extraordinary figure who made colossal contributions, uh, uh, who made mistakes, but not the mistakes he's usually accused of. You know, uh, I think <coughs> the economic policy he followed was one every major economist wanted India to follow at that time, you know, because we were newly independent, we'd been colonized by multinational corporation. Kashmir was a huge problem which he couldn't solve. The mistake he made, he made mistakes. One of the mistakes he made was that he gave no emphasis to primary education. I think if Gandhi had been alive, that was his greatest failure. I think not giving enough emphasis to primary education. The second mistake he made was uh, that he succumbed to vanity. If he had retired in 1958, as he wanted to, you know, we could have had a much more egalitarian process of succession. But he is a major builder of modern India. Without, uh, to go back to the point <coughs> that Dr. Chakravarti made, alone among Gandhi's followers, he understood the importance of linguistic and religious heterogeneity. He is the person who made sure that we would not become a Hindu Pakistan and Muslims and Christians would have equal rights in India. He is the person who assured the South that Hindi would not be imposed on them. You know, so I think uh, broadly his contributions uh, are greater than his uh, you know, negative points. But of course, finally, uh, if I may quote, I've quoted this before, but you allowed me to quote it. And this is a remark of Andre Bete who figures in this book. Andre Bete once said very, uh, very wisely, I mean, most of what he says is very wise. Uh, he said, um, the, the posthumous career of Jawaharlal Nehru reverses a famous biblical injunction. In the Bible it is said, the sins of the father will live on for seven successive generations. And in Nehru's case, the sins of seven successive generations are retrospectively attributed to him. Right? So that's it. Um, I, what are the chances of uh, India becoming a Hindu Rashtra in the next 10 years if the present dispensation continues? No, I think the chances are very low because all of us will fight against it. All right. But the, it will be a struggle. The struggle will continue. And, uh, you know, I think what Narendra Modi is now approaching the half time of his first term. I mean, he may get a second term. And... Uh, broadly, uh, uh, an objective, neutral assessment. One of the things that, if you say, what, is, what has happened in the two and a half years? He has ceded far too much ground to the RSS, much more ground to the RSS than people anticipated. Because in Gujarat, he has marginalized them, for whatever reason. Because in the election rhetoric of 2014, it was not about Hindutva, it was the development, jobs for the young, hope, anticipation. But the RSS is clearly fought back, and he's a much more important player. He's quite a lot of prisoner of the RSS today, much more. So that said, and the RSS uh, is a pernicious, pernicious, divisive, malevolent force. You know, and I use these terms advisedly because I've studied them deeply. And I, you know, I recently, I wrote a column two weeks ago on Golwalkar's Bunch of Thoughts. You know, it's a really dark and dangerous book, and he's the mentor of all of them. 
and I got an email from a Marathi friend who said, it's interesting you wrote about that column. Sometimes a Marathi friend who's a Marathi TV journalist, who says, if you ask a BJP person, what do you think of a bunch of thoughts? They'll say, uske liye separate discussion chahiye, agli baar, agli baar, right? Now, so this is, the, so the fight will continue, but I think those who speak hyperbole, uh, 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 hyperbolically about Hindu Rashtra, about fascism, underestimate themselves. You know, and I think underestimate the roots that Indian democracy and federalism has struck in the last six, 70 years. India today is not the Germany of the 1930s. These are ridiculous and false parallels, which diminish us as Indians and diminish all that Indians have done for the last 70 years uh, to build this country. Right? So in that sense, uh, there will be an attempt. The attempt is more now than it was under Vajpayee's regime. But it will not succeed. You know, it will not succeed. It will cause damage. It will cause hurt. All these nasty things like attacks on Muslims and Dalits, some of all will happen. But in my lifetime, we are not going to become a Hindu Rashtra. You know, you know. Thank you. This, uh, you, uh, you said Rahul Gandhi gives us here. Yeah. Makes, makes us nostalgic of uh, Indra Gandhi. And you said Narendra Modi makes us nostalgic of Vajpayee. What do you attribute to this? Uh, this declination of uh, quality of politicians and do you see any hope? You know, again, uh, I won't answer that question directly, but I'll, uh, I'll again urge you to uh, reflect on what I said some time ago. Progress is never, uh, history doesn't operate in a unilinear fashion. If you look at the way societies change and evolve, some sectors regress, some textures progress. Today, Indian entrepreneurs are much more dynamic, risk-taking, and in some cases, philanthropically oriented than they've ever been before. Today, Indian citizens are more aware, more independent-minded, less, less inclined to act as a herd than they ever were before. Citizens' activism, voluntary groups, I mean, I don't mean to flatter my hosts, but 30 years ago, did you have Manthan here? Was it as active 30 years ago? No, that's it. Okay. No, no, 30 years ago did you have it? No, right. So if you look at society has become more democratic. Entrepreneurs have become more philanthropic. You know, scientists have become more innovative. I mean, there are scientists in this room, and if I take their names, they'll be embarrassed, but who are building first-class institutions. So many parts of India are doing very well. I mean, in terms of public spiritedness, our political class is letting us down, but the other sectors of society are compensating for that. So, unfortunately, our media only talks about the political class, right? You will never hear about all the outstanding, interesting things being done. I mean, uh, I mean some of us, uh, uh, there are some extraordinary Indians building extraordinary institutions as we speak that will nurture the future of the country. At the young, everywhere I go, the idealism and the zest and the patriotism I see among the young is fantastic. And it's, it's a much deeper base. You know, previously, you know, the English-speaking upper caste elite uh, that dominated public discourse, that's gone. And that, thank God it's gone. So I think uh, uh, don't let the state of our politics and politicians stand in for the state of the country as a whole. The country is much larger than that. <laughs>